Welcome, welcome everybody. Shalom. And this is going to be an awesome night. I'm going to be talking about the woman of Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to be talking about the dragon. And we're going to go on over to Revelation chapter 13 and talk about the mark of the beast. So don't miss this. This is going to be awesome. The mark of the beast is coming up. So let's go right on over right now to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed in the sun with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and crying out in the pain and agony of giving birth. So just before we get too, too far into this, there are a lot of theories as to who this woman really is, okay? So we're going to talk about some of this stuff. And if you have a theory, I want you to leave it in the comments. Let me know what you think. Who do you think this woman is? Now, some people believe that it's Mary, the mother of Jesus. Some people believe that it's the church. Some people believe that it's Israel. Some people believe that there's a it's a combination of, of those three or a combination of one of those, of two of those three. Some people believe that it, it speaks of Israel um, or the people of God. Um, but there are a lot of pe different people, a lot of different church um, scholars, Christian scholars, and church fathers that have varying opinions, varying uh, different interpretations of who this woman is. Let me know what you think in the comments. And by the way, if you're just joining me, Shalom, welcome. We're going to get right into uh, uh, some awesome Bible study. And I want to interact with you live. I want to hear from you, get your comments and get your questions. So submit them as we go. And I'm going to be checking them intermittently. Verse two, she was pregnant and crying out in the pain and agony of giving birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, a huge red dragon with seven heads 10 horns and seven royal crowns on his heads. Okay, so this dragon, this dragon, um, when they say it's, it's the devil or Satan or the, 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 the beast, the world system with seven heads, 10 horns. Now we know from before a horn can represent a king or a leader of a of a nation seven heads meaning like maybe like seven nations or seven groups of nations and seven royal crowns on his heads now what i want to do too uh in the very beginning of this uh chapter it references um one of the references here is in Daniel chapter 7. So later on, Lord willing, we'll get into some of Daniel chapter 7 as well. So the his tail, the tail of the dragon, swept a third of the stars from the sky, tossing them to the earth. Again, so the stars here can be representative. They could represent, they can be a symbol of demons or evil spirits okay so his tail swept a third of the stars from the sky tossing them to the earth now you know a lot of people they draw a connection between this dragon and the stars to way back to the beginning when uh when satan fell from heaven and he took a third of of the heavenly angels with him so again let, drop drop some comments in here. Let me know what you think about who the dragon is, who the woman is, and what do the stars represent? And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, ready to devour her child as soon as she gave birth. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of people believe that this dragon um, represents uh, Satan and the woman represents uh, 
Mary, the mother of Jesus, because they're saying, well, Mary is carrying the son of God. And, you know, the, the devil does not want the son of God to be born. And, and we see this in, in the scriptures as well. When, um, you know, when uh, Jesus was born, you know, Herod made a decree to uh, uh, to basically try to try to kill him. Uh, by putting to death all male child children under the age of two. And we also see this kind of thing happening in the days of Moses. When Moses was born, you know, Pharaoh, um, he put out a decree, you know. And so it seems like when there's a very, very special child born, then it is preceded by or accompanied by the death of many children. So that's very interesting. So going back here to verse four, the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, ready to devour her child as soon as she gave birth. Okay, so um, in the name Most High, he uh, or she, I'm not sure, not sure who uh, is uh, the identity here of this particular person, uh, quoted Genesis chapter 37, verse 9. So let's go on over there. This is kind of like a little bit of rabbit trail, but I do want to uh, I do want to interact with you guys uh, in real time here. Genesis chapter 37, verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream. This is talking about Joseph, Joseph's dream, and told it to his brothers. And said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brothers. And, and his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers... Sorry, this is probably very, very small for you guys to read here. Um, Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come and bow down ourselves to the uh, to the earth now this this is a very good um i actually thought about this um in the name most high um but i'm glad that you quoted this because you know i thought it was running through my mind as i read uh revelation chapter 12 and uh very interesting because we got the sun and the moon and the stars exactly the same way as it talks about in revelation chapter 12 see the We got the sun here, the woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and the 12 stars on her head. Okay. So yeah, it seems like a it seems like a correlation here between this and the um the story of Joseph, the story of uh Israel, uh, Jacob, you know. And so again, let's look back. Let's look at this again, uh, Genesis chapter 37. So the sun, obviously, Jacob interpreted this to mean the sun is speaking about him. The moon is speaking about uh, Rebecca. And the 11 stars are speaking about the, uh, the 11 brothers of Joseph. You know, the, the, the other 11 of the 12 tribes of Israel. So we got Jacob and his wife and the 11 stars. Um, speaking of their sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. Very good point. Very good point. Thanks for mentioning that in the name most high. By the way, Shalom in the name most high. Shalom. Attila, good to see you. Good to see you guys. Okay, so Attila um, said the dragon... I I think is a very powerful atheist superpower and the woman the women are the true believers fleeing from that nation state that is a very interesting observation like i said there if you look at it if you look at um uh in church history all of the different church fathers and some of the christian scholars there are so many different ways of interpreting this um so yes that's that's a good way to look at it And in the name most high also said the church, women, the church in the world. Okay, so, all right. 
Very good. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 12. And once again, anything that comes to you guys, Ma, if you anything you want to add to what I'm saying, just drop a comment and um, and I'll get to that as soon as I can. Okay, so verse five, and she gave birth to a son, a male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. So now this is referring to Psalm two. And let's go on over to Psalm two. This is referring to, um, it seems to be referring to a prophecy of Jesus. You know, and this is another reason why a lot of people believe that this woman could be Mary. Okay, so Psalm 2, verse 7, I will proclaim the decree spoken to me by the Lord. You are my son. Okay, this is talking uh, to Yeshua here. This is talking to uh, Jesus. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Okay, this is God speaking to his son. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance. Well, apparently Jesus must have asked him because the nations are his inheritance. Amen. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance. The ends of the earth, your possession. You will break them with an iron scepter. So this is the same terminology, the same terminology that we see in Revelation chapter 12. There are so many layers of interpretation here, so many layers of different uh, meanings and interpretation to Revelation chapter 12. It's just amazing. It's something you could just meditate on for, you know, for days. Okay, so back to Revelation chapter 12. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, could that be talking about the ascension of the Lord? And the woman fled into the wilderness where God had appeared, or excuse me, where God had prepared a place for her to be nourished for 1,260 days. So we see this number over and over again through, throughout um, the book of Revelation, 1,260 days, speaking of... It, Basically, what it means is three and a half years. Verse seven, then there was war, then a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And once again, let me make this just a little bit bigger, just in case you guys are on uh, uh, mobile devices. A war bro broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But the dragon was not strong enough and no longer was any place found in heaven for him and his angels. And the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan. Okay, So here we got the dragon uh, specifically identified as the devil and Satan. The deceiver of the whole world. Now this is just an amazing phrase. Just an amazing phrase. Now think about this. How good of a deceiver do you have to be to deceive the whole world? Can you imagine? Put that in a human form. Can you imagine if someone was so good at deceiving that a certain, let's say, you can, let's point out, like, just imagine pointing out a certain person saying, this particular guy, he's so good at deceiving people, guess what? He didn't only deceive one, two people, 2,200 people, 2,000 people, 2 million people, 2 billion people, but he's, he deceived the whole world. That is powerful deception. I mean, that, that is deception. That is when you really got a spell on the people. That is when you really, you really, are so convincing. Either that or the people, and I think it might it might be the you know, option B. The people are so deluded. They are so um, 
given over to fantasy, to lies, to falsehood. They would rather have a sweet lie as opposed to an inconvenient truth because there's so much bound and enslaved to their own to their own pleasure they're so enslaved to their own pleasure they're so enslaved to a lie that the dragon here in the end times would be able to deceive the entire world again this is something that's just mind-boggling just mind-boggling in the name most high says i i think hosea uh chapter 2 verses 14 to 23 describe who that woman is so uh let's just quickly scoot on over there and see what it says okay so therefore behold i will allure her will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her i will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of acor as a door of hope she see uh, excuse me she shall sing there as in the days of her youth as in the day when she came up from the land of egypt and it shall be in that day says the lord that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. Now let's look at the fo footnotes here. You will call me Ishi, basically my, um, my man, literally me, <laughs> Ishi, my man, my husband, and no longer call me my master, Bali. Very interesting there, okay? Because Baal, Baal here means Lord or my Lord, okay? Baal, Baal, okay, Bali, no longer call me my Lord. For I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals, the Lords, and they shall be remembered by their name no more. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the creeping things of the ground, bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, with new oil. They shall answer Jezreel. Literally, God will sow. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. So here we got in the Hebrew, uh, mercy for lo ruhamna, ruhama, excuse me, and lo ami. Literally, I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. Very, very beautiful. Checking out more of your comments here. Attila said, I think. Um, not even sure how to pronounce that. Go bells is credited to have said, the bigger the lie, the more people believe it. Hmm, very interesting.
<laughs> Very good point, Attila. Um, the devil would also have an easier time if he influenced, controlled the mainstream media. Wow, that's a that's a topic all by itself. Joshua, shalom, blessings, brother. And he says, blessings to all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. Welcome, brother. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, just before I go here, I, I see the name in the name most high. Um, does that mean the woman is Israel and the 12 stars are the 12 tribes? It's. It looks like that. Uh, I mean, it, it, hey, in this kind of thing, I mean, there's multiple levels of interpretation and different ways of applying it. Uh, you know, it, it certainly does look like that. It certainly does look like uh, that scripture you quoted in uh, in Genesis. Yes. Jay. Shalom, Jay. Welcome. There is a God called the Great Deceiver and has misled millions so far all over the world. The God of this world, as we're talking about, um, the, the dragon, the devil. That ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, the, de the deceiver of the whole world. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Okay. So there's the there's the picture of the the dragon who was hurled to the earth and with his tail he took a third of the stars of heaven with him. You know, a lot of Christians believe Excuse me, a lot of Christians believe that that is um basically telling us that uh a third of the angels of heaven fell with Satan. Yeah. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down he accuses them day and night before our God. Again, you know, I, I cannot, I can't, <laughs> I got to pause there, okay? Satan is the accuser. The word Satan in the original Hebrew, meaning adversary, can also carry the name of accuser. Now, in here, it, this particular verse, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 it says that the devil, Satan, accuses them day and night before our God. So Satan is, it seems like he's, be, he's before God, like day and night, accusing the brothers, accusing the believers, the brothers, the brothers excuse me, the brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, think about this for a second. What that is telling me is that the devil is praying like all the time. Like he would put many Christians to shame in the amount of the amount that he prays. If he's before God, if he's before God day and night accusing uh, the believers, he prays a lot, doesn't I mean, that's what I see. He is, you know, I remember talking to a, a pastor not too far from where, actually just right outside from where I am right now. And I said to him, I said, you know, a lot of Christians, they believe that if, uh, you know, if they, if they believe that Jesus, um, you know, uh, came to this earth and, you know, uh, if, if they believe that Jesus died on a cross, if they believe that Jesus rose again, if they believe that Jesus uh, went to heaven, and if they believe that, uh, if they read the scriptures, uh, if they go to church, and if they pray, then they think they're good Christians. But I said to this pastor, face to face, it was just me and him, and I said, you know what the truth is? The truth is the devil 
believes that Jesus came to this earth. The devil believes that Jesus died on a cross. The devil believes that Jesus rose. He was there. He was there trying to get Jesus off the cross. And the devil knows Jesus rose from the dead. The devil also reads the scriptures. He knows the scriptures. We see that in the temptation of Christ. The devil also prays. I said to that pastor, I said, what makes you better than the devil? And he was shocked. He was like, wow, I never heard about that. I never thought of it that way. Christians who do all these things, they really, what are they doing more than the devil's doing? What do they know more than the, that, than the devil knows? Like, really? And so that pastor, he, just before he left, he said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach that on Sunday. I said, well, then, yeah, you should. <laughs> Go for it. All the power to you. Preach it. But that's the thing. But for those of you who may be watching this, you might say, well, what would be the answer to that? What would, a re what would really distinguish a true Christian from the devil? That sounds like, <laughs> that sounds like quite the question, but hey. We're on the topic here. Remember James himself in the book of James chapter two, he said, you believe there's one God? Even the demons do. Even the evil spirits do. Great. Kudos to you. Even the demons do and tremble. It's like, you need a whole lot more than that. You need obedience. You need, you need works, as James said in James chapter two. James 2, 24. We see then, therefore, a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. That's the words of James. That's not my words. James 2.24. And so what makes a real Christian, a Christian, a real Christian, uh, b better than the devil is, re is repentance and really believing by making your legs show people, making your leg, do walk the walk, not just talk the talk. What I, that's what I mean. When you actually do something, when you, uh, you can't say I believe in helping little old ladies across the street if you never, ever do that. Okay. Your belief and your actions have to, have to be, go hand in hand. You can't sit there and watch little old ladies cross the street and just say, I believe in helping little old ladies across the street. And if you never get up, if you never get up and actually help that little old lady across the street, how can you say you believe in it? In the same way, if someone says they believe in the holiest man that has ever lived, Yeshua, how can you say you believe in him if you never actively pursue personal holiness? So we see that the devil stands before the throne of God day and night, day and night, praying, accusing the brothers. Verse 11. They, they have conquered. They have conquered him. The believers have conquered the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So how does that work? Well, by the blood of the lamb, you can say what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. His blood speaks of my death. His blood speaks of the death of my sin in my sinful life, in my sinful past. Romans chapter 6, verse 2. How can you? who are dead to sin, live in it any longer. How can you, who are dead to sin, live in it any longer? That's how the blood of the lamb works. So you overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb, identifying with the crucifixion, putting that sin to death by faith, rising with Jesus by faith in newness of life, Holiness, obedience, that's repentance. That's how you apply the blood of the lamb. We overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so a lot of times 
it's not just enough just to silently believe something. A lot of times you got to speak it. I believe, therefore I've spoken, as it says in the scriptures. Something powerful about the spoken word. You know, God created everything by speaking. Very, very powerful. Jesus healed people by speaking. He cursed the fig tree by speaking. He cursed people, even cities, entire cities. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. He cursed entire cities with his, with his words. He blessed people with his words. He raised the dead with his words. It's very powerful. So we have to have the faith. We have to have the obedience. We have to have the words. We have to have our feet and our hands and our tongues. You know, do the walking, do the engage in our faith. Getting back to your comments here. In the name of Osiris, says the dragon, the dragon is Rome. I know I ran into a lot of people that was, that says that as well. Uh, and you quote Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16, explains the Eucharist meaning. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16. Let's just go on over there. And... Just bear with me here just for a moment. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were worshiping the sun toward the east. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yes, Jay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I know that I, I, I've, I've, uh, when you quoted that earlier, that did, that did come to mind. And, uh, yeah, I have to be a little bit, uh, wise here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In the name most high, also Exodus 24, verse 8, refers to that blood covenant. Um, let's go on over here to Exodus 24, verse 8. Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the, on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Amen. Amen. Okay, so back on over here to Revelation chapter 12. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so as to shy away from death. They, they were not afraid to die for Jesus. Remember Jesus said, if, if you try to keep your life, you will lose your life. Uh, those who lose their life for my sake will keep their life. And that's, you know, uh, that comes to mind as well. And, uh, you know, a lot of people of this earth, they love their lives, earthly lives, uh, the worldly lives, so much so they, they don't want um, to give up their sin. They don't want death. You see, like the true born again experience is you know you you guys know this but again for some of you who may be just joining us some of you who may be watching this later um the true born again the true born again experience involves death i mean i'm not talking about biological death of course i'm talking about death to yourself death to your own to your selfishness um the true born again experience requires death 
because the true born again the true born again experience is re is resurrection when you i mentioned this before when you die to sin when you die to this world when you when you identify with the crucifixion i am crucified with christ and i rose with christ so when the old is dead the old life is dead and you identify with jesus resurrection and you live now a new brand new life all things are you know all the old has passed away and all things have become new that is death um i know i remember an old preacher back in the 70s uh this preacher would always say I can take you to the very spot I died. I can take you to the very spot I died. Of course, speaking about completely.